new videos every day. Life, wisdom. Since the American Psychiatric Association is about to release their updated version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, I thought I would make a couple videos explaining how this book works and how mental disorders are created. Wait, how mental disorders are created? That sounds a little funny. Although treatments in psychiatry are biologically and medically based, assessment and diagnosis of mental disorders is not. This means that there are no biological markers of mental illness, there are no physiological tests or any physical test whatsoever used to diagnose any one of the 300 mental disorders listed in this book. And there will be even more mental disorders in the upcoming edition of this book. This is because there is actually no known pathology or physiological basis for any of these so-called mental illnesses. The basic assumption of psychiatry is that you can control or manage people's behaviors biologically using physical interventions, such as medications, electric shock, and brain operations. This is why psychiatrists even call what they do behavioral management. But this is a medical practice that is achieving these changes using physical interventions. So the drugs and medications alter your body chemically, and electric shock or brain operations alter your body physically. But psychiatry is really only half of a medical practice, because the diagnosis of these mental disorders is not medically based at all. Without the presence of physical diagnostic markers, such as an infection or a genetic abnormality, abnormal hormone levels, or clearly deformed organ structures, psychiatry has had to borrow a diagnostic method from a completely different school of psychology, and that is the school of behavioral psychology. And behavioral psychology, of course, studies behaviors. So the American Psychiatric Association will take a set of related behaviors, clump them together, and call it a disorder. Then the psychiatrist attempts to change or manage those behaviors through physically changing your body. So we have one half of psychiatry, the diagnosis, which is completely psychological. These disorders are diagnosed strictly through clinical interview. And then the other half of psychiatry, which is medical, the physical intervention such as medications or electric shock therapy. I'm going to go ahead and give you an example, and I think this example will make all of this abundantly clear. So let's look at attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder and how it's diagnosed. Maybe with some kind of physical test or brain scan? No. I actually have the DSM right here, and I'm going to go ahead and read you the diagnostic criteria of this mental disorder. Inattention. One often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, work, or other activities. Two, often has difficulty sustaining attention in tasks or play activities. Three, often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Four, often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace not due to oppositional behavior or failure to understand instructions. Five, often has difficulty organizing tasks and activities. Six, often avoids, dislikes, or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort, such as schoolwork or homework. Seven, often loses things necessary for tasks or activities, e.g. toys, school assignments, pencils, books, or tools. 8. Is often easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. And 9. Is often forgetful in daily activities. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like me some of the time. And you only have to present 6 of these 9 criteria in order to be diagnosed with Attention Deficit Disorder. And I just want to point out that there is no physical test listed. There's no brain scan, there's no blood test, 
This is simply a list of behaviors, and merely presenting these behaviors can land you with a diagnosis of this mental illness. There are nine more criteria for the hyperactivity impulsivity diagnosis, and those are one, often fidgets with hands or feet or squirms in seat. Two, often leaves seat in classroom or in other situations in which remaining seated is expected. Three, often runs about or climbs excessively in situations in which it is inappropriate. In adolescents or adults, this may be limited to subjective feelings of restlessness. Four, often has difficulty playing or engaging in leisure activities quietly. Five, is often on the go or often acts as if driven by a motor. Six, often talks excessively. Seven, often blurts out answers before questions have been completed. Eight, often has difficulty awaiting turn. And nine, often interrupts or intrudes on others, e.g. butts into conversations or games. Yeah, I don't know any kids that act like that. I mean, climbing on something when it's inappropriate to be climbing? Now, these are the actual diagnostic criteria for ADHD. And I just have to point out one more time there's no brain scan. There's no testing for viruses, bacteria, or parasites. There's no infection. There's no abnormal organ size. There's no abnormal hormone levels. And there's not even a toxicology test done to see if there may be some presence of toxins causing those behaviors. So really what we have here in terms of diagnostic criteria is a list of behaviors which adults find objectionable, annoying, disruptive, or just plain rude. Things that your grandma would have called bad manners, like not doing your homework, screwing off instead of doing chores, talking out of turn, or fidgeting nervously in your chair. But these are also behaviors that really don't bother little Johnny very much. He's a kid, he has lots of energy, he loves to talk, he loves to play, and he'd certainly rather sit in front of the Xbox than do his homework. But these behaviors are bothersome to the teacher, and little Johnny's parents, and maybe even his classmates. So if little Johnny is disruptive in class, we can give him some drugs to manage his behavior. And now he's so zonked out on an overdose of psychostimulants that he finally sits down, shuts up, and starts to behave. But it brings up an interesting question. Who is this treatment really helping? Are we giving Johnny these drugs for his own benefit or just to keep him from disrupting the teacher and his class? And you'll see this occur in institutional settings as well, like nursing homes, where if one of the residents is getting out of hand, antipsychotics can be administered as a chemical restraint. I recall seeing a story not too long ago of a man who kept getting up out of his wheelchair. And once this became too annoying for the staff, they actually administered antipsychotics, a major tranquilizer, in order to keep him in his chair. Hopefully, going over the diagnostic criteria for ADHD made it very clear to you that ADHD is diagnosed based strictly on behaviors and conduct, not some biological medical condition. This is just about the way that people are behaving. And if it's not clear enough, then let's move on to our next example. Mental disorder number 314.9, conduct disorder, which is characterized by being aggressive towards people or animals, destruction of property, lying, stealing, and other serious rule violations like sneaking out of the house, running away from home, or skipping school. So if you burn ants with a magnifying glass, get in fights at school, spray paint graffiti in an alley, or steal energy drinks from the 7-Eleven, then you have a mental disorder called conduct disorder. And I'm not making this stuff up. These really are the criteria for being diagnosed with this mental illness. Now, certainly that is some disorderly conduct, but I just have to re-emphasize that we're talking about behavior. 
and making an assumption about somebody's brain based solely off of their conduct and behavior is a little bass backwards. And I'm sure that some of you can remember when you look back on your childhood, times that you skipped school, snuck out of the house, lied, shoplifted, or shaved the whiskers off the cat. And most of us would have called this being a kid or getting in trouble. And the biological treatment that most of us got was a spanking. And this brings up an interesting point. When we punish a child or arrest an adult, we do so under the pretext that they are responsible for their actions. And so we're teaching that there is some personal responsibility associated with the things we do and that some of our behaviors will have certain consequences. But the philosophy of psychiatry is diametrically opposed to this idea of personal responsibility. Once Johnny is diagnosed and labeled, he's no longer responsible for his behavior. His behavior is all due to his mental illness. And somehow because Johnny has a disease, even though he has no infection, or that his brain is defective, even though there are no detectable abnormalities, he's somehow not able to control his behavior. And the only way to actually control his behavior is with psychotropic drugs. Parents who have gone down this route where their child receives a diagnosis often encounter this problem. Because children are smart and kind of sneaky about getting out of trouble or doing naughty things and then finding ways to not get in trouble for them, you might have a situation where little Johnny stands up in class and goes, mother suck on my chocolate salty hole, and then tells the teacher, it wasn't me, it was my Tourette syndrome. So you have a situation where the mental illness is being blamed for the behavior. Or maybe little Johnny tells his teacher that he tried to do his homework, but his ADHD was preventing him from finishing. So psychiatry really is just behavioral management. It's social conformity in the form of a pill. So you can take square pegs and fit them into round holes by rounding off the edges using psychotropic drugs. But it really is the lack of any biological pathology that will be the ultimate downfall of psychiatry. Because you can't take a diagnostic method that is purely psychological and based on behavior and couple it with a treatment method which is physical and expect to have any kind of good results. In this video, we talked about ADHD and conduct disorder. And in a future video, I'm going to count down the top 10 most ridiculous mental disorders. Have you ever felt conflicted about something? Have you ever felt torn between two different things? In a future video, we're going to talk about the psychology of inner conflict and how you can overcome that inner turmoil. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it and you will share it with your friends. Be sure to give me a thumbs up and friend us on the Facebook. We've all heard that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain, but is it true? Check out my video, Depression and Your Brain. As humans, we all have basic needs. To learn more about these needs and what happens if you're not fulfilling them, check out my video, Maslow's Expanded Hierarchy of Needs. To hear more about psychiatry from the perspective of an actual psychiatrist, check out my interview with Dr. Colin Ross on psychiatry. Is it a scam? If you have problems with your sexual performance or reaching orgasm, you could have female sexual dysfunction. To learn about this mental disorder, check out the video Orgasm Inc. Thank you so much for watching my video. I really hope you liked it. I hope you'll give me a thumbs up in your Damn, friend us on Facebook, suck on my chocolate salt
And remember, it's not me, it's just my Tourette's.